I wonder if you would begin by telling me how you first got involved with the FBI and what were the activities that you were doing for them? Okay. Um, I was approached by the FBI through the man that I was living with. In other words, the man that I was living with uh, was working, as a matter of fact, as an FBI informant. I saw him functioning as an FBI informant. I knew how he felt about being an FBI informant. And um, at one point he asked me if I wanted to go to a meeting with the people that he was informing on. And I thought it'd be really interesting to see these dangerous people <laughs> that needed an informant in their midst. Um, soon after that, uh, he asked me if I would like to be an FBI informant, if I would consider it. I talked it over with him, and I didn't see anything wrong with it. I mean, I, I saw things that were questionable. But um, on the basis of being open to the idea, they themselves came to talk to me. Um, what was explained to me when I met them was that I wasn't supposed to do anything illegal. I wasn't supposed to suggest criminal activity. I was basic, basically there as um, a safety valve. They wanted psychological profiles on people. They wanted me there as a woman and functioning as a woman um, talking about who people were, what their weaknesses were, what their strengths were. Um, another thing that they did was throw me into the situation cold. Like they didn't, they said, we're not going to give you any information. So I, I was totally apolitical when I joined the chapter of the, the Buffalo chapter of VVAWWSO. And I didn't know anything about the left. I didn't know if they were part of the left. All I knew was that they had, they were somehow something about veterans. Uh, that was in their name, Vietnam Veterans Against the War Winter Soldier Organization. Um, whenever they did give me any information, I knew that it was important because they told me specifically that they would, they gave me encouragement at times to get involved in certain activities. But other than that, it was like being hired as a graduate assistant uh, doing some research. And what were the terms of your contract? Okay, the terms of the contract were first, a loyal, I had to sign a loyalty oath to the United States government. I had no problems in signing a loyalty oath to the United States government. I felt um, what was explained to me was that I was to serve my country in a certain capacity. And the terms of that capacity was I was to be a safety valve, a voice of reason. In other words, if I heard something that I couldn't accept or that I couldn't understand, I was to function as myself in, in, in that kind of uh, situation. And other than that, they wanted to know who people were, where they lived. They wanted identification of people. They wanted to know um, if people had emotional problems. And what they explained to me about, the only thing that they did explain to me about VVA WWSO was that here's a group of veterans. Because they're veterans, um, they've got emotional problems. Now, they're legitimately a veterans organization. As a matter of fact, they were not just a veterans organization, but I didn't learn that until much later. Uh, until I started getting, knowing, getting to know people. But what they explained to me was that with these, pe these people who were dissatisfied with what was happening in America, who were very disturbed at what they had seen in Vietnam, that because they were disaffected from American life, that other people who were disaffected and alienated uh, would, would um, join the group. In other words, what they, they sort of spread out a scenario for me that people from the criminal fringe people from the communist fringe and these alien, poor alienated veterans are all going to get together. And they, what they explained to me was that the criminal fringe would suggest violent overthrow of the government, the criminal fringe would suggest uh, breaking laws, and that because veterans had emotional problems, they would be very susceptible to breaking laws. Thus, I was to, I was to be a safety valve in that kind of situation. And I was to make sure that veterans did not get manipulated. And uh, when they explained that to me, that was something that they didn't say be a provocateur. They didn't say do some suggest criminal activity. They said be yourself and ask questions. And that was. And then in addition to that, I was supposed to sign a loyalty oath to the United States government. Well, how did you feel about performing this function for them? I, I take it you weren't doing it out of political reasons, but were you doing it out of curiosity, out of uh, for money, or what, okay, what motivated okay. you? Okay, that's, that's a really fair question. Um, I, had, I had been in Buffalo 
I'd come to Buffalo to go, to go to the university. I mean, that was my connection with uh, Buffalo. Uh, my marriage, um, I was a strict Catholic. My marriage hadn't worked out, so my personal life had sort of been shot. Um, while I was at, while I was a graduate student at the University of Buffalo, several of my professors informed me that if I thought that I could teach exactly what I thought, uh, then I was being very naive about what the situation was uh, on universities, that there had to be a definite split between what you taught and what you really thought. And I was very, I got very upset about that, and during the course of um, my year of graduate assistant work, the only thing, I started just to drop out of all my classes, and all I was doing was teaching. I really enjoyed teaching, but I realized that what had been said to me did make sense, that if, in fact, I couldn't teach what I really believed, then I wasn't going to have a career. Um, I wasn't, if I wasn't willing to compromise, then I wasn't going to have a career. So gradually, during uh, the course of the year before I was hired, my personal life had too many contradictions in it, um, and my professional life had just sort of dropped out. Uh, when I was approached, I mean, I had had a lot of unresolved questions, uh, particularly about the Vietnam War during 1970. That was the first year I was married. That was my senior year in a parochial college. Um, my father was anti-communist. My husband was anti-communist. They believed that the government were the only people who were involved in such a complicated dis situation. And they felt basically that if anyone else was involved in such a complicated situation, they probably would be making the choices that were being made. Um, I heard some discussion of Vietnam on the campus. People kept talking about genocide. People kept saying we're there for profit. And I really didn't know. I mean, I kept balancing what my family believed and my husband believed against what other people were saying. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was accused of sitting on the fence, and that's where I was left. And I guess that's a place that most Americans end up. They just really don't know what to believe because they hear two sides of the question. They're pretty cynical, and they don't see anything that convinces them. At the time that I was approached, I mean, they were excite offering me exciting work. And I guess my ego, uh, part of it was ego. I think, you know, being, they said, you can do something for your country. Well, I wasn't doing anything for myself, and I didn't have a career. And um, I weighed up the pros and cons. Um, I, just, I went home, and I talked to my family about it. And it was with my family that I made the decision to work. I come from a very large Catholic family, the oldest of 12 children. And so I talked with my family, and only two uh, people in my family said, we don't think you should do it. And I listened to their reasons, and their reasons weren't forceful enough, as far as I could tell. And it was with, also with my family that I made the decision to quit. Um, because during the course of working, I wasn't supposed to tell anybody, as a matter of fact, but I mean, I did tell, I mean, to me it was, just a normal job. Uh, people who, as far as I was concerned, people who lived good lives didn't need any kind of secrecy. So that, I mean, I generally tended to tell people what was going on in my life and didn't feel any problem in doing that. So when I was working for the FBI, that was the first time in my life that I kept consistently one fact, a particular fact, that of being an FBI informer away from people. Other than that, I was living life as I normally had lived it. During the course of working for them, I just kept meeting contradiction after contradiction. In other words, I was going through, um, a, I, it was the first time I was off a campus. It was the first time I was not a housewife. Um, in that kind of situation, I was doing a lot of reading. I was starting to learn about Vietnam from veterans. I was starting to learn about Attica and the problems relating to Attica. There were all these things that I was starting to learn. Also, people that I knew were getting arrested and it was, they were being arrested over uh, step, putting their foot off the, the curb. I mean, things that just didn't make any kind of sense to me, I would go to the FBI and I'd say, look, this just happened. What do you think's going on? And I consistently did that. Any contradiction that I came up with, I ended up taking to the F I would take to the chapter people and I'd say, why is this happening? Or they would tell me of a contradiction, contradiction and give me their analysis. And how did the FBI react to these statements you made to them? Well, for the most part, they were very, I mean, I was dealing, most of the FBI agents that I dealt with were Catholics like myself. And 
they would explain, well, you know, this is a piece of propaganda. That really didn't happen. For example, I knew of an incident that had taken place in Bethlehem Steel where two men were um, caught in some kind of wind tunnel and it would have cost the plant a lot more money to shut down the wind tunnel and not get the fire stoked up so much in the foundry. And two men held down at the cost of their life for something like half hour to 45 minutes. One man lost his hearing. A friend of mine who was working at Bethlehem Steel told me about that. The company knew about that because they had a couple ambulances ready and waiting, but they did not turn off the wind tunnel when they knew the men were in danger. I went, I mean, when I found out about that, I was horrified. Most often, if I came up with a contradiction like that, what I was told is they're not telling you the truth. So that for a long time, I just really didn't know who was telling the truth, who was telling lies. And you kept on reporting during this period in which you had these doubts? Yeah. I mean, I didn't... Once I realized that, well, two things happened which made me realize that this wasn't just any other job. And those two things were, at one point, I wanted to change the structure of my relationship with the man who was living with me, who was also an FBI informant. I said, I don't want this to be any longer a monogamous relationship. I'm not happy with the relationship. At that point, he couldn't handle it, and he threatened my life. He said, I'm he says, I am going to blow your cover. I am going to destroy your life. I can do that to you. And all of a sudden I realized for the first time that he could do that, that I was in a position where someone could say, I am going to take your life and mangle it. And, th and I knew him to be speaking truth. And that floored me. I just had not realized that someone could have that much power over me. And the second thing uh, that occurred within a month, month or so of that was I went down to Washington and was in my first national demonstration. Uh, the national organization... Did the FBI know about this? They didn't encourage me to go, but they knew that I was going. They knew about both incidents. I went down to Washington, D.C. to demonstrate for universal unconditional amnesty as part of the chapter. And um, I saw personal friends with blood all over them and cops standing by being sarcastic about it. And I just start burst into tears. And when I came back, that was one of the, you know, that was one of the first things that I talked about. I said, I just do not understand those men. Those men were satisfied with having. I mean, those men are veterans. They serve their country. There's blood all over them, and those and those cops think that that it's a legitimate thing to do in the course of a demonstration over universal unconditional amnesty. I mean, I just could not believe that that had happened. And those were two incidents which, it was after that that I started having far more difficulty with, um, with the role that I was playing because I realized that I was in a real double-edged kind of situation. And I, I didn't want to run away. I mean, I didn't know still who was right, who was wrong, or how to resolve the contradictions, but I felt that if I ran away from the situation, then I would never know. Did you ever speak to the FBI about what would happen if you decided to um, end your informing activities? Yeah, we had we we quarreled for about after July. I had increasing doubts about what I was doing, and I started questioning them, particularly after the Watergate testimony. Uh, one of the things that I was very worried about after watching the Watergate testimony was the security of the information that I was passing, because I had passed so much information. I wanted to know whether or not the people that I informed on would be hurt through that. And I respected those people, and I was very concerned. Uh, when I questioned their security, their internal security, I asked a lot of questions about, where does this information go? How do I know that it's safe? And after watching John Mitchell and the whole thing about Ellsberg, I kept, you know, I wanted to know how much of the information was being sent to Washington, um, who was going to use it, how it was going to be used. And... The answers that I got were not satisfactory. They kept, Gary, from a local position, was trying to guarantee me um, the security of the whole, the, the fact that the FBI is a very good organization. We don't have any internal problems. Well, after watching the Watergate testimony, I knew they had internal problems, and I felt that what he was telling me was not the truth, that he was trying to convince me with a lot of uh, just rhetoric 
that these people were secure when I felt that I had seen enough national testimony to indicate that they were not secure. Mm-hmm. And this information, I couldn't be secure. I, I couldn't rest easy that this, this information would not be used against them. And then we had a whole, a man who returned to Washington, and I think he came from Washington, came to talk to me several times um, and talked to me in very philosophic, humanist philosophic terms about what I believed. And we had, like, long three-hour discussions. And the way those discussions went, particularly at the point where I'm, what I, when I'm saying that I had to quit, that I felt as a matter of conscience, and I mean, I made a very full decision to quit. It was a matter of conscience, ethics, intellectual decision, and emotional decision. I mean, at every level that you have to make a decision, I was finally saying, I cannot continue any longer. So their first response was, you're being emotional. You're being subjective. Uh, you say one thing one week, you say another thing the next week. There's something wrong with the way you, with your perspective. And we refined that conversation. Um, it boiled down to the fact that I had more of a dialectical approach as opposed to a static. And I co- finally I was able to say to them, what you want me to do is have my father's uh, perspective. I said, when my father reads the newspapers, he puts in all the facts that agree with what he already believes and he discards the facts that don't make any sense to him. I said, I can't do that. I learned not to do that by going to college. I said, you have to deal with all the contradictory facts till you find a hypothesis that makes sense. So the fact that I say one thing this week and, a, and another thing a month from now only means that I've resolved more contradictions and understand the situation better. So the fact that I don't have a consistent perspective does not mean that I am crazy or that I don't have a proper perspective or that I'm not making any sense. The okay. last argument that he used, which was a consistent argument used all along, was the most despicable. That argument was, you are an informer. You know these people. You respect these people. You always tell the truth. You owe it to them. You have an ethical responsibility to remain as an informer because the next informer may not care. He may only be doing it for money. He may not like these people. He may not understand when they say something that it's only a joke. Thus, the next informer may really... Uh, hurt these people that you like a lot. Thus, you, thus, as a safety valve, you ought to remain as an informer. And that's the point when I really got very angry and I said, look, I said, I do not have that responsibility. All you're revealing to me is that you are willing, able and willing, to use a method of gathering information that you know has flaws in it, that you know can hurt people, and you're perfectly willing to use that method of gathering information, whatever its flaws, even knowing that it could mean people's uh, reputation, it could mean people's tri- you know, trials in the future. I mean, I, I was astonished that they would try to say that to me. That was that smacked of uh, my husband telling me, you've got to remain with me because I'm going to commit suicide, and someone telling me, no, you are responsible for your own life. If someone else takes his life, you could not have ultimate responsibility for someone else's life. And I knew it was a specious argument, and that's when I put all of the contradictions together, and I knew that they were not, <laughs> that they were not copacetic, that they were not legitimate, that they were perfectly willing to exploit the situation, and they didn't really care uh, whether they were getting proper information or not. And what steps did you take after that? After that, the final piece of information that they wanted from me was information on a takeover. Uh, Around the country, veterans organizations were going to have demonstrations uh, for November 11th, which was Vietnam, what was Veterans Day. And they wanted to know what the local organization was planning in relationship to that. Um, I really didn't know what to do. Uh, A week before November 11th, I had my final meeting with them, and I I was in a bind. What I had to ask them was, what are you going to do? If I tell you, are you going to arrest people because you know that they're going to do this? If I don't tell you, are you going to arrest them because you're mad that I'm quitting? And they assured me 
that the only thing they were going to do with that information was make sure that no confrontation took place. And I didn't know what to do, and I couldn't talk to people about what I should do. So I finally just blurted out the information. I gave them the wrong day. I gave them a Friday instead of a Monday. And I just I just felt that I was dealing with... <laughs> I mean, I really felt terrible about having to, to answer any of their questions because I, did, I just didn't know what to expect from them anymore. I had trusted them all along. I'd worked for them in, an, in what I felt to be an honest capacity. And I'd learned through a whole process of working for them that I could not trust them, that even if they felt they were being honest, that they were lying to themselves a lot and that they were not being responsible um, as, as members of a law enforcement agency, that uh, they were helping to set up their apparatus for 1984, and they didn't even care. Do you think it would be accurate to say that in the course of informing for the FBI, you were, in effect, won over by the other side? I'd say that it's fair that, I mean, I came in to the situation pretty apolitical with a lot of anti-communist sentiment. And I knew that the only, the only um, sort of limitation in my feelings about the godless communists, I mean, I'd heard a lot about the godless communists when I grew up because I was Catholic. Um, from my husband, I'd heard about uh, he had worked overseas on a couple of bases, not, work, not actually uh, as a member of the military, but that was how he, I mean, he was a very patriotic American, and he worked overseas uh, on government contracts, earning enough money to put himself through school. And I'd heard a lot about communists, and he would tell me, when you grow up someday, you'll understand just how bad those communists are. Now, when I walked into that situation, I didn't know. I really could not, I did not know whether the government was as bad as everybody said it was, or whether the left was as bad as everybody said it was. But during the course of the time that I was there, I mean, what I saw was the government making mistakes, and I saw the left making mistakes. But during the course of time, what I came to understand was the people who were consistently, most often, lying to themselves about the kind of role that they were playing was the FBI in relationship to a number of government agencies. I mean, there were contradictions all over the place. It seemed to me that people in America were confused they were upset. They had been barraged with one scandal after another after another. They were becoming more and more cynical. They joked about the vote having no meaning. And as far as I was concerned, um, that, that's not a joking matter. People are alienated. People are upset. People don't know who to believe anymore, who to trust anymore. And they know they're living in a democracy where their particular vote, I mean, they talk about Humpty Dumpty, eeny, meeny, miny, moe. They know they don't have any power anymore, and yet we're supposed to be a democracy. Up, in, up, up until the point that I was hired for that job, I, didn't, I wasn't a women's liber. I wasn't uh, a political person. I did not understand politics. I didn't pay attention to politics. I was a woman, and I saw things from a very personal perspective. I think that during the course of this, I've seen enough and come in contact with enough that I think that there is, there is corruption at the very heart of government. Americans had better start paying attention to politics and who's doing what and what is happening because they're losing, they're losing the substance of their democracy. People have to fight to remain free, and Americans are becoming a soft, unhealthy people and a very confused and alienated people. Okay, thank you very much.